so, you know, there are some, some churches, they actually right now take a break. Yeah, in fact, my cousin is a pastor in Pennsylvania, and he would stop worship at this point, and he would say, okay, we have refreshments over here, and we're going to take the next 30 minutes just to greet and talk to one another and have some community time together. Sorry, this pastor doesn't do that. (laughs) But afterwards, (laughs) um, and you might want to hurry, there's some chocolate cupcakes over there. Okay, they're really messy. Okay, so please don't give them to the three-year-olds or the kids acting like three-year-olds, okay? Because <laughs> they will be everywhere. But there's some goodies over there that you might want to enjoy. Incidentally, the worship bulletin gives an invitation if you ever want to help make those goodies. Maybe you like to make the chocolate chip cookies different. Maybe you like nuts. Oh, I'm sorry for you. But maybe you like to make nuts in yours. Well, you, know, you can sign up and say, I'd like to help with the goodies. Also, um, we're also trying to build a team of people that would be able to care for others um, at times of grief or illness. And so one of the things that we can do is uh, give them meals. And with that in mind, I just want to remind you that there will be the memorial at 11 a.m. on Saturday for Michael Paul. And um, we want to take some time to be with our family, our friends that we love, and support them. So um, please um, plan on that. That's Saturday at 11 a.m. right here. There's other things in the worship bulletin, and please read through them and take note of what's in there. And if you have questions, find Daryl behind the sound booth, and he'll explain everything to you. Right, Daryl? <laughs> Father, I pray that you would open your word to us right now. God, I pray that you'd help us to understand you a little bit better because of the time we spend here to get today. Holy Spirit, we do need your anointing. We need your anointing on us so that we can receive what you want to give to us. And we need your anointing to be able to take what you give us and share it when we leave this place. Lord, we may even need your protection from ourselves as well as, Lord, just from spiritual forces that would try to rob us of truth and hope and peace and joy and love and forgiveness that you'd want to give to us. So God, have your way in us today. In Jesus' name, amen. We're in a series on discipleship. And... This is a series we started, I think, a year and a half ago. Um, I know Paul's concerned that we're going to never get through the Gospel of Mark, but I promise you eventually we will. And, and this is a series on making disciples. The, the Gospel of Mark is just a really a, a great detailed description of the relationship and the teaching that Jesus tried to do with his disciples. So we've been following that train of thought to try to see what he's teaching. We are at the pivotal place in the Gospel of Mark. For those of you who were here last week, remember that Peter made the declaration that is, as Jesus himself says, came to him totally through God. Peter says, when asked, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. You're the Messiah, the anointed one. You are God who we've been waiting for. You are the one. And he's thrilled with that and he understands that. And Jesus turns to him and says, Peter, That was revealed to you not from yourself, but that's been revealed to you by God himself. It's a divine revelation. And the fact is, when you stop and think about that, there's not a single one of us who comes to faith and believing that Jesus is the Christ, son of the living God. We don't do that on our own. Oh, sure, some of us have said, oh, yeah, I studied, I asked questions, I researched them, I argued and all. Bottom line was, God was challenging you to believe. It's the Spirit of God that reveals God to us and helps us to come to a place of belief. Even faith is a gift that God gives us. It doesn't come because we're just so intelligent, smarter than the average bear, right? It's because God has done something within us to open up our hearts and make it possible. Now, we still have a choice at that moment, though, don't we? We can choose as to whether we're going to believe or not. 
That's why even Jesus, when he was asking the disciples, he said, who do people say that I am? Oh, some say you're Elijah. Some say you're, you're Moses. Some say you're one of the prophets. You know, there's all kinds of, you might even be John the Baptist somehow coming back alive as well. And, and they thought that he was somebody special, but, but still, you still have to come to a place where you say, I'm going to believe or I'm not going to believe. And I guess even as we open up this morning, and that's probably the question we still need to answer, is who do you say that Jesus is? And do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, Son of the living God? Well, after this incredible, incredible, unbelievable Jesus patting him on the back, blessing him and saying, man, Peter, you get it. This is amazing, Peter. I'm going to build my church on you because this is a wonderful Peter. And he's like celebrating this and all. And then Jesus says, okay, you know, guys, let's go. And as he starts to walk away, he says, you know, there's some things we need to now talk about. Because how am I going to be the Christ? And what does it mean for me to be the Christ, the anointed one, the sent one of God? Because you all have been thinking that this is going to be some kind of military reign and we're going to get rid of Rome and Israel's going to be this wonderful place again and all that. And he said, no, no, it's going to be way different than that. In fact, if you've noticed, I've not been military at all. I've been healing the sick, casting out demons, and changing people's lives. And that's what I'm here for, to make a difference in eternity. And then he begins to explain. So follow along, if you would, in Mark, the eighth chapter. And we're going to start at verse 31. Mark 8, verse 31. It was right after Peter said, you're the Christ. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders chief priests and teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise again he spoke plainly about this and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him can you imagine telling God what to do Seriously, can, can you imagine saying, God, you've got it wrong. Uh, uh, whatever you're doing, I, I disagree with you. In fact, I know things better, God. I mean, who of us would, would think that we were so wise that we could say, God, I've got a better plan? Who of us would be so brazen to actually rebuke God? Well, if you're being honest about it, most of us. Most of us have had opinions that are different than God's. Even when we pray, sometimes our praying is really not about seeking God's will. It's about telling God what he's supposed to do, what we want from him. And in the process, if we really stopped and we're honest about it, <laughs> we're not seeking him. We are trying to order him. A few of us have a, just a bit of a compulsive, controlling mindset. Let's tell God the best way because maybe God doesn't understand the best way. We have a clearer perspective of our lives, right? Than God does. So we're going to tell him what to do. And here goes Peter. Jesus has just spoken plainly. And it's interesting because Mark even says that. Jesus has just spoken plainly about his death and his resurrection. Do you see it? Okay. The scribes, the Pharisees, they're going to reject me, the teachers of the law, the chief priests, everybody. I'm going to be killed and I'm going to rise again. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Although they didn't get it. <laughs> as plain as it was, they didn't understand. And Peter says, uh, no, 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 you got it wrong, Jesus, and we're not going to allow that. That's not the road we're going to take. You're not going to go in there. You're not going to be rejected. You're not going to be rebuked. You're not going to be killed. And so we're not going down the way. And, and it's funny because Jesus, Peter takes Jesus aside, Mark says. God, come here, Jesus. And can you imagine this? You just got to get this picture. Okay, this is Peter, and this is God. <laughs> and he says, come here, Jesus. 
He walks him away from the other guys, you know, because I've got to discipline you and I don't want to do it in front of the guys. Jesus, this dying thing, <laughs> you got it wrong, man. And you got to stop talking like this. You know, you, you, you need to think differently, Jesus. <laughs> Can you imagine this? <laughs> I'm going to tell Pe- Jesus, I know better than him. I've got it figured out. And that's what Peter's doing. <laughs> when Jesus, when the Bible says that Jesus was open, it says he was very clear. He spoke in very plain language. They're going to reject me. It's going to include the chief priests. It's going to include the religious people and all. I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to rise from the dead. Simple as that. Okay. Now, looking at it from this side, we hear that, and we say, oh, yeah, it was very clear, wasn't it? Right? I mean, it's very straightforward. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be killed, and I'm going to rise again. Then why didn't they get it? Well, Jesus actually says, In fact, the word there is Jesus was frank and open with the disciples about his mission. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed. Must be killed. And after three days, rise again. In chapter 10, just a few days later, Jesus speaking again. He says, verse 33, we are going up to Jerusalem, he said. And the Son of Man, incidentally, the Son of Man is the way Jesus refers to himself in the Gospel of Mark. It's his way of saying the Messiah. He says, the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him, and kill him, and three days later he will rise. This is the conversation. You might remember they're up in the northern part of Israel, over in the Gal- near Galilee, over in the Gentile area of Israel. And they're going to come down and take about six months to get down to head into Jerusalem where Jesus is going to die. <coughs> he's coming to last months of his ministry. The people he's most trying to teach are these 12 disciples. He's trying to help them see this truth. He wants to change their lives, and he's saying, okay, look, I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to die, but I'm going to rise again. In Mark 10, 45, Jesus goes on. He says, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So Peter takes him aside. Says, "You know, Jesus, it's not the way it's going to happen. I have a better idea. You need to simply stop talking about dying and stuff like that. You need to stop talking about this negative stuff and all, Jesus. It's just not going to happen that way. In fact, we'll just join you and we'll take over." Oh no, no. <sighs> have you ever rebuked Jesus? Be honest about it. Have you ever rebuked Jesus? Have you ever told him that the way that it's going you don't like? That what he's doing in your life you don't agree with? Have you ever held your fist up at him and gotten angry at him? And you know, there's some moments that that happens and incidentally that it may not be such a bad thing. There may be some times where you simply stop and you raise your fist at God and you say, why? I I do recall Jesus hanging on the cross saying, why? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And there are those moments of despair and crying out. Look at the number of times David cries out in the Psalms, particularly in the first 75 Psalms. God, why? Why? Why are all these people oppressing me? Why why are they after my life? Why are they beating me down? Why am I out here in the desert like this? Why? And there's a part of that that we simply question we don't understand. But that's not really yet rebuking Jesus, but it could move into it. We move from the question to now we're simply going to accuse and we're going to say he's wrong. 
And that's where David does a shift if you follow the Psalms again and again. David may be crying out, why, what's happening, Lord? But I will yet praise you. And there's a theme that you'll see as you follow through the Psalms in which David moves from that pain, that point of questioning, to saying, but I'm going to keep my focus, my trust in God. Jesus responds to Peter with a way that most of us would rather him not speak to us. He's just said, Peter, God has spoken through you. You understand who I am. And now he says, get behind me, Satan. Get out of here, dude. You're Satan in the flesh. Get out of, and literally, get out of my sight, Satan, is what he says to Peter. Here, here's the phrase. He says, you, the, the word for, for, for the, that's used in that text is, you're a scandalon. Scandalon means you're a trap. You're a baited trap. You're a Satan trap, Peter. You're a Satan stumbling block. If you're trying to talk me into leaving the cross, you're on Satan's side. Get out of my sight. Whoa! Peter, you're speaking against the very will of God. And I will not have anything to do with that. Get behind me. Go where I can't see you. I will not take the easy way out. It's Matthew chapter 4. Satan has Jesus weak because he's been praying and fasting for 40 days. And Satan wants to try to talk him out of what he's about to do. And so in Matthew, the fourth chapter, if, get, notice even just that word, it, it, this very first word out of Satan's lips, if, if you are the Son of God, he said, Matthew 4, 6, and 7. He said, throw yourself down. He's got him up on the top of the temple, actually, and place of worship. He says, if you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered, it is also written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Then again in verse 9. All this, he takes him on a mountaintop now. He says, look around here. All this I will give you if you will simply bow down and worship me. What is it Satan's trying to talk Jesus into doing? Take the easy way out. As if he has the ability to give him all that. Well, don't forget, at this moment, because of sin and evil, Satan is, small g, God of this world. Had authority over the world. Could he have given Jesus the world? Maybe. Because he had authority over the world. And the world would have failed. The world would have perished under him. Jesus, right now, you know whatever crisis is going on, whoever's in need, Go with those who are moving to the scene of the emergency. Guide, guard, and bless them to be your servants. And make your presence known to whomever's in crisis. In Jesus' name, amen. What Satan is tempting Jesus with is taking the easy road. If you just, just do this, just bow down to me. Just worship me. And everything will be okay for you, Jesus. And guess what? Then you won't have to suffer on that cross. Then you won't have to be scourged and tortured. Then you won't be rejected by the chief priests and the Pharisees. It'll just be easy, Jesus. And Jesus rebukes Peter. He goes on with Satan. He says, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. There's a little phrase here that, that goes on in Mark, and Mark says that, that Peter was rebuked because his concerns were human, not from God. That's not abnormal, is it? 
Don't you have human concerns that bother you? Things that trouble you? If you've just lost your job, won't that bother you? If you're sick, like right now, some of you know that Kristen Doolin has another tumor on her colon, and her Virgil and Jan are back there trying to meet with her, their daughter, trying to encourage her. She's talking about very serious stuff. The doctors have said the rest of her life may be a process of moving from surgery to chemo to surgery to chemo and then death. Whoa. Think about their concerns, the emotions that they're feeling as they walk through these days. Human concerns are not abnormal, not unusual. But what, what is wrong in this situation is that Peter is allowing his human concerns to try to stop Jesus from doing his divine work. And, and we need to even look at that ourselves. Are we more focused on merely human concerns? When you get into circumstances that, that are hard for you, do you get so focused on those circumstances that you forget to focus on God's view of things? Mark 8 goes on. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. John MacArthur says this is an incredible invitation. And that this invitation deals a death blow to man-centered, self-centered invitations. This is not an invitation to health or wealth or fulfillment or prosperity or healing or a boasted self-image or trouble-free living. This is an invitation to self-denial, cross-bearing, and obedience. In Matthew 10, Jesus said, whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown before my Father in heaven. This is serious. Have you ever wondered about this text when Jesus is here saying, pick up your cross and follow me before he's even gone to the cross? What did it mean to them? We well, have to remember that in the days when Jesus was younger, over 300 times, People were crucified on one day. They lined the streets of Jerusalem all the way out, out the city. And who crucified them? Romans. And why'd they do it? Because these men had revolted against Rome and did not want to follow Roman rule. And 300 by the government were put up on Roman crosses, tortured and killed. And you would have walked into Jerusalem, walking to the temple, and you could not have missed these bodies that hung there for quite some time. So when Jesus says, pick up your cross and follow me, this is, this is deep. You need to be willing to do something that is going to be painful, hard, and tough. It's going to be something that's going to be beyond your abilities. You need to be willing to pick up your cross, deny everything, and then follow me. I want you to just pause for a minute. Peter got more concerned about human concerns than he was about what God wanted. What are your human concerns? What are the things that are weighing on you? Circumstances that you're experiencing that, that get you distracted, that, that cause your attention to go away from God? What, what are those things? They may be natural concerns, and those things are understandable. But could I warn you about this? Some of our concerns, frankly, have to do with death and dying, don't they? Illness and sickness and stuff that's going to go with us. But, but let me warn you, death is not, is not the worst thing that can happen to you. Now, in our world, in our economy, we kind of think of it that way, right? 
and, 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 and in a human way of thinking, okay, death is finality, death is the end, death separates us from one another, but death is not the worst thing that can happen to you. So what is? The worst thing that can happen to you is eternal separation from God who is love. The worst thing that can happen to you is to experience God's judgment for the rest of eternity. And that is worse than death. Death is a channel. Death is a passageway. Death is a separation from this life into the next. But damnation, judgment, separation from God is much worse. And that's why Jesus comes and dies. He wants to break that dividing wall of hostility. He wants to open up heaven so there's a place there for us so that we can come in and be with him. He wants to change our world. He wants to set us free. And so it, that's why he can say it, and the scripture does in Revelation, that in, at the end of time, when the, the worst than the last enemy, which we don't like, and that is that enemy, death, that enemy will be destroyed. Throw it in the lake of fire. And at that time, Life will change and there will be no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain because the old order of things will pass away and all things will become new. The worst thing is not death. The worst thing is separation from God. I want you to pause and think for a minute about the disciples and what they went through because they believed in Jesus Christ. Jesus has told them, I want you to, to follow me now, guys. I want you to be willing to deny yourselves. I want you to be willing to take up your cross. I want you to be willing to die for me. And what happened to the disciples, do you know? Well, let's just go over that and review for just briefly. Simon Peter, who was appointed by Jesus the leader, was eventually martyred in Rome during the reign of Emperor Nero. As the story goes, Peter asked to be crucified upside down so that his death would not be the equal of Jesus, and the Romans obliged him. Andrew, according to the 15th century religious historian Dorman Newman, Andrew, the brother of Peter, went to Petros in western Greece in 69 AD where the Roman proconsul Agaetus debated religion with him. Agaetus tried to convince Andrew to forsake Christianity so that he would not have to torture and execute him. But when that didn't work, apparently he decided to give Andrew the full treatment. Andrew was scourged, then tied rather than nailed to a cross so that he would suffer for a longer time before dying. Andrew lived for two days during which he preached to passers-by hanging from a cross. James, son of Zebedee, known as James the Greater, according to Acts 12, 1 to 19, says that James was killed with a sword. The newly appointed governor of Judea, Herod Agrippa, decided to ingratiate himself with the Romans by persecuting leaders of this new sect. After James was arrested and led to the place of execution, his unnamed accuser was moved by his courage. He not only repented and converted on the spot, but asked to be executed alongside of James. And the Roman executioner is obliged and both men were beheaded simultaneously. John, John was the only one of the disciples that we believe was not executed, but died in old age. He did not die a violent death. Instead, he lived on a little island called Patmos, but he was exiled there. Sometime around 100 AD, John died. John is one of the company generally thought to have, to have died naturally. Leader of the church in Ephesus is said to have taken care of, he was said to have taken care of Mary. If you remember, Jesus actually is hanging on the cross and says, here, take care of my, my mother. Mary lives with him until she dies. During Domitian's persecution in the middle 90s, he was exiled to the island of Patmos. There he was credited with writing the last book of the New Testament, Revelation. And uh, an early tradition tells us that John actually was able to escape unhurt from uh, a boiling that occurred when he, they tried to put him in boiling oil in Rome. So he didn't just have it easy all the time. Philip, the first of Jesus' disciples, became a missionary in Asia. Eventually, he traveled to the Egyptian city of Heliopolis, where he was scourged, thrown into prison, and crucified, 54 AD. 
Bartholomew supposedly preached in several countries, including India, where he translated the Gospel of Matthew for believers. In one account, impatient idolaters beat Bartholomew and then crucified him, while in another, he was skinned alive and then beheaded. Either way, he died for Jesus. Thomas, whom again I think we unfairly call the doubter, Thomas preached the gospel in Greece and India where he angered local religious authorities who martyred him by running him through with a spear. They actually sent uh, four uh, guards to kill him with a spear. <coughs> Matthew, according to legend, the former tax collector turned missionary was martyred in Ethiopia where he was supposedly stabbed in the back by a swordsman sent by King Herticus after he criticized the king's morals. Watch out. Criticize the politician and you get in trouble. James, also known as James the son of Alphaeus, James the less. According to Fox, James, who was elected by his fellow believers to head the churches of Jerusalem, was one of the longest lived apostles, perhaps exceeded only by John. At the age of 94, he was beaten and stoned by persecutors and, they, and then killed by them hitting him on the head with a club. Thaddeus, also known as Judas or Jude, according to several stories, was crucified at Edessa in 72 AD. Simon the Canaanite, now also known as the Zealot, Simon preached in Mauritania on the west coast of Africa and then went to England where he was crucified in 74 AD. And there are some other possible accounts for his death as well. Paul, the one who I believe was um, chosen by God to replace Judas was beheaded in Rome. <coughs> Jesus said to his disciples, deny yourselves. Take up your cross and follow me. ready? To deny ourselves for Jesus Christ? John MacArthur said, I no longer want to associate with the person that I am. I realize my sinfulness. I realize I cannot earn this. I abandon my self-effort. I abandon the works righteousness system that dominated Judaism and dominates all religion in the world. You can be good enough for God to accept you. I abandon all self-effort. I abandon all self-confidence. But it's more than that. I abandon all self-will. I abandon my own ambitions, my own agenda, my own plans. Jesus invites us. Deny ourselves. Pick up the cross and follow him. And the question I'd ask you is this, does this offer have enough value to you that you would give up everything for it? Will you die for Jesus Christ? True conversion views Jesus Christ and the gospel of Christ and salvation and heaven as so precious that no sacrifice, no personal sacrifice is too much to make in order to receive that. What are you willing to give up to have Jesus? And what, what will you give up if you don't? Have Jesus. And as Jesus concludes this text, he says, if, if you're not going to declare me before men, then I will not declare you before God. What will you lose if you are ashamed 
of Christ.